Today's five steps to becoming a better athlete is brought to you by the Seek a Strength stream of one-to-one -one coaching. Recently, we hired a new employee who took over a lot of our admin for us, which freed up a lot of time for myself and there to take on some new one-to-ones. So if it's weightlifting, powerlifting, rugby, soccer, kayaking, uh, free solo climbing, we can help you with that. Welcome back to Seekistan. Welcome back to another athletic development video. One thing we get asked a lot in the comments by our clients, by the members who are on the Facebook page is what are the main things I can change to make me a better athlete? So obviously myself and Owen talk a lot about being a better athlete, the things you can change in your life or change in the way you approach training to make you better at your sport or better at training or just being in a bit better shape in general. The things we're going to talk about today are things that you can control. They're things you mightn't commonly think of things that are under your control, but there are certainly uh, referred to these as kind of action points or things that if you change a few, uh, few aspects of your life around, you could certainly alter these particular factors. Is it menacing if I hold a screw like this? Yeah. I don't think it's that menacing. So the number one and the first actionable point that you can do as an athlete to improve your athletic career and your performance and especially your satisfaction around your sport is consistency. So consistency is something that you have almost full control over. Depending on who you're listening to, you have absolutely 100% control over your consistency. Now, what do we mean when we talk about consistency? We talk about consistency in training. We talk about consistency of technique. Is it nutrition? Well, it's absolutely everything you do has to be as consistent as possible. If your nutrition is supposed to be on point and it needs to be on point, then it needs to be as consistent as possible. The amount of sessions you do needs to be as consistent as possible. So it's no good, good dry for like two or three months and then not training again for four or five months. There's no point being like, okay, I'm going to get shredded for these competitions. I'm going to cut down weight class and be more competitive. And then you give it two, three good weeks of calorie counting and then you lose a lot of weight, but your training also goes to shit instead of putting more consistent action into your training. So consistency among the best athletes is something that is not even measured in weeks or months. This is a thing that's measured in years and in some cases decades. For example, if we looked at the career of Lu Zhaojun, he finished at the age of 37, started lifting somewhere in the region of his early teens from what we can gather. So we're talking 20 odd years of lifting. Gabriel won his bronze medal in Rio after just about 20 years of lifting. So when we talk about consistency, we mean consistency for the long term and consistency across all your actionable bites that you can do for training. Nutrition, training, mindset around it, journaling, why are you journaling your training, where you record your training, what kind of equipment you use, how, what time of day you train, all of these things. Consistency is the most important thing we see among elite athletes and the best performers and the best amateur athletes is consistency of everything you do. And this is something you have massive control over. Now, of course, unforeseen life circumstances can, of course, throw a spanner on this randomly, but over those 10 years, this consistency of action adds up to a phenomenal level of performance. And it's definitely the thing you should start with, whatever you're doing. If you decide to do a new action, if you decide to do something that's going to make your training better, then be consistent with it and give it a lot of time. You know, especially we see people inconsistent with programs. We see people program hopping, coach hopping, technique hopping even sport hopping sometimes and never give anything that real long-term benefit where they can really realize their potential at that sport following on from number one of consistency number two is decision making of course intelligent decision making we don't mean bad decision making so one of the most important things you can have after you're consistent is making decisions that are intelligent and then being consistent with them of course so decision making comes down to selecting your coach which program you run, on what days you train, should you be even training that day, what kind of sport you pick for yourself, what kind of nutrition you use, what kind of nutritionists you use, what kind of foods you eat, what kind of shoes you wear. All of these things are incredibly important. And these come down into the micro decisions, deciding on how much will you jump for your next PR or how much will you jump from the next warm up set. So you've got 100 kilos, what's the next most intelligent decision making thing you can do? It affects every single action you do, every single training you do, every single time you decide to eat the food that you shouldn't eat as opposed to the food you should be eating, all adds up in the long run. All of these 0.000001% decisions all add up to that increasing, you know, 5-10% performance. Should you take 500 milligrams of Sanazol all a week or should you take a thousand? All of these decisions are so important and you don't even think about them. Sometimes we think about these big decisions when you change coach or when you change sport. 
But those micro decisions are some of the most important things you'll be doing. And these are some of the hardest ones to be consistent with is these micro decisions you make every day when it comes to your nutrition. Are you going to eat Pop-Tarts for breakfast or are you going to have the meal plan that was laid out for you? Are you going to go training today or are you going to sit at home and think maybe I'm a little bit too tired even though you know you should be training? Are you going to go drinking at the weekend or are you going to stay at home for the sixth weekend in a row? Because you know you have a competition in two months time and you know that the competition you've decided that that competition is more important for you than coke and hookers which is important for other people and you shouldn't judge people for that so decision making those micro decisions you've got to be on point with them so leading nicely on from that is going from decision making or having better decision making or being a bit more synced with your decision making and then going into self-confidence uh, building a sense of self-efficacy within yourself and this is certainly one of the cases where people don't commonly think about uh, a kind of an action point for them in their sport or an action point for them in their training. So uh, a lot of time we just think of somebody having a lot of confidence. You'll think of, of Gabriel, you'll think of me. So these phenomenal athletes uh, who we meet and they're very, very confident people. They're very competitive people as well. And they you don't really ever think about needing to foster that confidence with them. But certainly with, with a lot of athletes, confidence or self-efficacy isn't usually a trait it's more a state that they come in and out of right so uh, although they might have a high level of self-efficacy one year or one season while they're playing the sport due to a host of factors that confidence or self-efficacy might go down and then it might have to be brought back up again so if you're an athlete who's training and you mightn't you mightn't have even noticed this but you might notice over the last few months i haven't been feeling the most confident or when i go for heavier weights i don't feel great about it or I might be slightly worried about it or why am i suddenly worried about back squats or worried about this competition when i mightn't have been before what can you do to start building this self-confidence or what might be a good uh, point to start on? Well, the first thing is just identifying it, uh, seeing how confident you are about your own particular situation. A lot of time when we, we talk to athletes, particularly when we talk to them in person, uh, initially people will say, I'm super confident. I'm always really confident with the lifts. And then as you kind of get into it a bit more, you train with them for a few more days, you find out they mightn't be that confident in, in every aspect of their sport. Um, and you might have to do some things around it. So once you've identified that, that confidence or lower self-efficacy might be an issue, you next need to, to try and build up some momentum, right? So there are certainly things you can do in a kind of CBT setting where you could innately give someone more confidence uh, very very quickly that's not ro really what we're suggesting here what we'd be suggesting is designing your training around uh, having very few missed lifts right so having or having very few missed times if you're a runner or having very few opportunities for failure uh, in a different sport right so uh, in target shooting you wouldn't necessarily go and do competition style targets immediately or smaller than competition style targets immediately you might first open up those those brackets you might want to facilitate a bit more success within your training build some momentum around that then so uh, you can take a, a a target shooter as example for this or an archer as an example for this if their competitive distance is 50 meters and they usually shoot a 10 centimeter circle at 50 meters uh, and and confidence is starting to become an issue you could shrink the distance into to 25 or 30 meters for the majority of your training then start stretching it out once you've built up that kind of positive momentum around your training and this goes across all sports uh, a lot of the time we want to push ourselves incredibly hard we want to be the people who are going into the gym and hitting heavier weights or running faster times or jumping higher heights where you really need to make sure you're you're first hitting all those those precursor weights times heights and then you start to build up momentum through success over the course of m weeks months years of training around that so it is it's that's a, our favorite way of building confidence with an athlete is just momentum in their training this brings us on next to to competitiveness It's my surgical four by two. Uh, this brings us on then to competitiveness with athletes, right? Uh, competitiveness is certainly a trait that a lot of athletes will have. It's certainly a precursor for success in a lot of sports. But competitiveness can also be fostered, right? So competitiveness in, in business environments 
if you're used to working in highly toxic business environments, you're well used to competitiveness being fostered, right? Uh, it works really well. Incentive-based selling works really well. Team-based incentive-based selling works incredibly well. Uh, that kind of corporate bro mentality, that's all fostering competitiveness, right? Uh, small bonuses on your salary fosters competitiveness. So you can do the exact same thing, thing in sport. You're probably not going to have a monetary competitive element to this, although it certainly would have been something that featured in sport very heavily um, in weightlifting in the kind of earlier years where you hear the stories about $1,000 being put on a platform and two athletes going at it in training, trying to lift as, as much weight as possible and the winner would get that cash on the platform. It's something that's featured in almost every professional field sport at the moment is uh, win bonuses. Even non-professional team sports will get win bonuses. You'll then get scorers bonuses. You might get uh, certain goal-based bonuses that if you wanted to have a certain level of penalty counts uh, for 10 matches and you achieve that, everyone will get a bonus. A lot of times these bonuses are financial, but for yourself, you can certainly foster competitiveness in other ways as well. So take, for example, you're somebody who lifts weights in their shed at home. Uh, you finding people to train against or kind of bounce off in training can often be quite difficult. We'll often rely on things like Instagram to see what other people we know are doing. We might rely on going to a competition once every six or eight months. If competitiveness is an area of your game where you might have a small deficit or you mightn't be quite maxed out on that, uh, we have a much better idea to start working with a coach who has multiple athletes on the books at the moment. It would be a very good idea to get involved in some sort of like communal or forum setting where people are regularly posting their training. Or ideally, you'd go to a gym where they had a weightlifting team, powerlifting team, whatever it is, whatever sport you're doing, and you train in that kind of environment. Now, you don't have to be training in that environment all the time. And for most of us, if we have a good level of competitiveness anyway, you'll spend most of your sessions not anywhere near that headspace. You might be going there 2% of the time, 5% of the time, uh, possibly 10% of the time if you want to try and foster more competitiveness within yourself. But for, mo for people who have that deficit and need to bring that up, you might need to go there twice a week and then do two sessions at home. Or you might need to just train there nonstop for six months and not train at home on your own, you know? So it really does depend the situation you're in, but you can certainly foster a level of competitiveness within yourself. And don't lie to yourself by saying, oh, I'm a really competitive person. Uh, unless you're banned from playing board games in your family home, you're probably not competitive enough. So the fifth and final and the cap of the pyramid and probably the least crucial and least actionable decision you can make in our tips for being a better athlete is optimization and innovation. So this is a very small part of your training, but a certainly useful part nonetheless. So if we look at the optimization part of your training, what does that mean in terms of actionable decisions and actionable things that you can do in your training and around your training that will make you a better athlete? So optimization is something like finding a pair of straps in weightlifting that work better for you so it might be looking at a new pair of shoes that suit you better there's a slightly better heel height it is taking turkestrone from one brand and not using it from another brand it oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the day after we made that video. Pew, pew, pew. So it's the optimization of getting maybe grass-fed beef, beef as opposed to grain-fed beef. It could be getting your own chickens. It could be anything to do with nutrition that's improving it. It could be removing gluten from your diet for a period of four months because you're gluten intolerant and you know it just a slightly bit more information during your harder training blocks and it would make more sense for you to get rid of bread. It could be a slight change in time when you get up in the morning so you know by the time you get training everything is a lot better. It could be what time you train at all during the day. It could be something as large as changing your entire career to suit your training better. So optimization is something that you can always do and always make better. And something, optimization is probably something that you will always be looking at session from session, month from month, year from year, from every training block you're doing. Optimization is something you can definitely be better with. Now, it's very important as well, just to be cautious in relation to optimization. It's not something you should ever be hung up on. A lot of the best athletes will also be the best athletes who will make do in spite of. They will train wherever they need to train. They will use whatever bar they need to use. They will play whatever, whatever football and pair of boots they can get their hands on. So while they're always looking to be better and get the best decisions made and best piece of equipment for themselves, 
they will never use that as a crutch if they're not optimized because of course good is the enemy of perfect so in this scenario you always want to be looking for better but it's never a crutch an excuse for you to not be better yeah i think a lot of the time optimization or like innovation or whatever however you want to phrase this is really a thing that the more elite you get or the higher level you get the more important it becomes you know so it's it's very unlikely somebody who's a terrible high jumper is is suddenly going to come up with a version of the Fosby flop and then become the best high jumper in the world like so or it's very unlikely that if you're a terrible swimmer you'll go off and develop the speedo shark suit and you'll get a world record you know like these innovations and these changes or tweaks in the minutia of your game uh, that suddenly give you that bump ahead really are for the the kind of elite level athletes you know so certainly we do get people who will hold off on training for a number of weeks until a certain pair of weightlifting shoes will come you know or they they won't want to train when they're away at college because the barbell in college isn't good you know like you you need to get everything else right and then you start looking at those kind of like innovations or so small kind of optimizations like you're basically optimizing a system that's already perfect you need to make sure the system is already perfect before any of those will have any real influence over you or your sport or you as an athlete and your ability to to recover and do better so one thing that will happen with this kind of like optimization or innovation thing is most of the time there are acute fixes to a particular situation. So uh, somebody might have a great split jerk and they start squat jerky and it feels better, you know, and and they want to go down that road because it's it's a very easy and quick and effective use of your time. Uh, but you really like it's not 18 months of gaining weight for a rugby player, or football player, and then suddenly they're better on the field because they can make bigger hits. Uh, but I would say that it, it's the very, very top of that triangle is optimization or, or evolution of, of those kind of minutiae. You don't really need to look into it. Uh, it's not unless everything else is optimized. You shouldn't be looking to optimize just those smaller things. Just to make a point, this video was brought to us or this idea was given to us by a commenter on YouTube and I can't find who made the original comment, but it was written down and I know it was from YouTube comments. So whoever made the comment, thank you very much. We appreciate it. If you've any other videos for ideas you like to talk about, leave them in the comments below and thank you for watching the video. Feel free to leave a comment and a like.